this old new house. We bought an old house, my boyfriend and I. He's in charge of the new construction, converting the kitchen into the master bedroom, for instance, while I'm on wallpaper duty. The previous owner covered every wall and the ceiling with wallpaper. Removing it is very brutal, but oddly satisfying. The best feeling is getting a long peel similar to your skin when you're peeling from sunburn. I don't know about you, but I kind of make a game of peeling on the hunt for the longest piece before it rips. I know, it's a little weird, but it's fun to me. Under a corner section of paper of every room is a person's name and date. Curiosity got the best of me one night when I googled one of the names and discovered that the person was actually a missing person. A missing date matching the date under the wallpaper. It was pretty freaky. But the next day I made a list of all the names and the dates. Sure enough, each name was a missing person on the dates to match. We notified the police who naturally sent out a crime scene team. During the commotion I heard one tech say, Yep. It's human. And I'm thinking to myself, wait, human? What's human? The tech asked me, ma'am, where is the material that you removed from the walls already? This isn't wallpaper that you were removing. Seeing Red Everyone loves the first day of school, right? New year, new classes, new friends. It's a day full of potential and hope, before all the dreary depressions of reality show up to ruin all the fun. (laughs) I like the first day of school for different reasons. You see, I have sort of a power. When I look at people, I can sense sort of an aura around them. A colored outline based on how long the person has to live. Most everyone that I meet around my age is surrounded by a solid green hue, which means they have plenty of time to live. Definitely plenty of time left. A fair amount of them have a yellow orangish tint around their auras too, which means a car crash or maybe a tragedy, something along those lines. Anything that takes people before their time, as they say. But the real fun is when the auras venture into the red end. (laughs) Every now and again I'll see someone who's basically a walking stoplight. Those are the ones who get murdered or kill themselves, even more tragic than the yellow and the orange. With that in mind, I always get to class very early so I can always scout out my classmates' fates. I know, it's a little sick though, but it's a thrill for me. The first kid who walked in was basically just radiating red, (laughs) and I chuckled to myself, hey man, too damn bad bro. But as people kept walking in, they all had the same intense red glow. Finally, I caught a glimpse of my rose-tinted reflection at the window, but I was too stunned to move. Our professor stepped in and locked the door, and with everybody around me glowing red, I took a glance at the professor, and lo and behold, his aura was green. When my brother goes away. I hate it when my brother Charlie has to go away. My parents constantly try to explain to me how sick he is, that I'm lucky for having a brain where all my chemicals flow properly to their destination like undammed rivers. When I complain about how bored I am without a little brother to play with, they try to make me feel bad by pointing out that his boredom likely far surpasses mine, considering his dark confined space in a dark room in an institution is far more boring. I always begged them to give him one last chance. Of course, they did it first. Charlie has been back home several times, each duration shorter than the last. And every time without fail, it starts again. The neighborhood cats with gouged out eyes showing up in his toy chest. My dad's razors drop on the baby's side in the park across the street. My mom's vitamins replaced by the dishwasher tablets. My parents are hesitant now, using last chances sparingly. They say his disorder is charming, makes it easy for him to fake normalcy and to trick the doctors who care for him into thinking that he's ready for rehab. I guess I'll just have to put up with my boredom if it means staying safe from Charlie. I hate it when Charlie has to go away. It makes me have to pretend to be good until he's back.
I knew someone was there. I lived in an old apartment in 2002. The place was built in 1990, so it was just over 100 years old when I moved in. The living room and the kitchen were fine though, but the bathroom and the bedroom were just really unnerving. Like, I just always felt like I was being watched, especially in the bedroom when the closet door was open. Those unnerving feelings though became moderately uncomfortable as I settled in. I felt safe in the bedroom, but only if the door was locked. One night, I was in a dead sleep when I heard a loud bang on my bedroom door. When I got the courage, I got out of bed, checked the apartment, all the windows were closed and locked from the inside. The door still had a chain secured. No one was inside. I mentioned the closet in the bedroom. I never liked going in there and if the door was open. But for some reason in my head, I would always hear gasping noises. So for that reason, the closet always stayed closed. A little over a month after that, I was woken to a big bang on my door. I was dead asleep, but something woke me up, and it was pressure like me being held down. It was pitch black in my room. I couldn't see anything, but I knew something was standing over me. When I could finally turn on the bedside lamp, nobody was there. Then after I couldn't sleep in the dark, I had to sleep with the lamp on. Then it didn't scare the life out of me. After that, the unnerving feeling of being watched completely intensified. Friends would come over and comment how being uncomfortable in the bathroom was like being watched. It became so uncomfortable for me that when I had the chance to move to another unit, I jumped at it. I packed up and got out. After I moved, several people rented the room, and they would move out within months. I became friendly with the building manager, and I told him that I felt the place was haunted, and surprisingly, he kind of laughed it off. Years after they were renovating the place, I went and I checked out the apartment and it looked nicer. Didn't feel as creepy. I got to talking with the building manager and through the course of the conversation, he just throws out that there was a former tenant that committed suicide in the closet by hanging themselves. He also mentioned that the original designer of the building lived in that apartment and died in there. I wasn't mad at first when I heard about it though, but I felt validated that my experience was very much real. Robert the Doll Legend has it that the 116-year-old straw doll is haunted by a malevolent spirit. His original owner, a boy named Gene Otto, used to blame his mishaps on the doll until the mischief became more sinister. It is said that Robert the Doll wreaks havoc on people's lives from allegedly breaking bones to causing car accidents. Even today, Misfortune allegedly befalls those who insult him. This is the haunted story of Robert the Doll. There's a bit of debate surrounding Robert's origins. Some claim that he was gifted to his late owner Robert Eugene Otto from his grandfather in 1904. But locals recall a more sinister backstory. They claim that the straw-filled toy was given to young Otto by one of his family's young maids who hexed it in retaliation of a wrongdoing. Officials in Fort West Martello Museum, where Robert resides today, deduce that the doll was actually never intended to be a doll in the first place. Robert's origin were traced back to the Stafe Company, the same toy company that made the very first teddy bear, where a company historian told the museum that the doll was most likely meant to be a part of a window display. Nonetheless, Robert was taken in by the Otto family and became little Gene Otto's best friend. Young Otto was so enamored with the doll that he named it after himself, clothed it in his very own clothes, and despite the toy's awkwardly large size, carried it with him wherever he went to. Otto was so close to his new friend that his parents would often hear him whispering to it. It seemed totally normal until one day they heard a deep voice answering back. Corey Convertito, the curator of the West Martello Museum and Robert's current caretaker, 
responded in an interview with this. He talked about it in the first person as if it wasn't a doll. He talked about it as a live entity. The haunted doll terrorized 534 Eaton Street. Soon, however, strange things began to happen around the Otto household. According to legend, Otto's parents would wake up in the middle of the night only to find their poor boy screaming and surrounded by overturned furniture. As Robert Eugene Otto grew older, Robert became even more malicious as mutilated toys started appearing in the Otto's home, and young Otto would cry, Robert did it! Once a plumber who had been hired to make repairs around Otto's home claimed that they could hear their children's laughter, though nobody was home at the time. When he looked around the room, the plumber noticed that Robert the doll had moved from one side of the window to the other, seemingly on his own. What's more, the plumber swore that the object that had been in Robert's lap ended up on the other side of the room, as if he'd thrown him. Eventually, Otto grew up and moved away. After studying at the Academy of Fine Arts in Chicago and the Art Students League in New York, Gene Otto met his wife, Anne. Otto brought the doll back to his childhood home on 534 Eaton Street in Key West, Florida, and he called the home the Artist House. Otto designed a special room for Robert in the attic, complete with furniture, toys, and even a teddy bear of Robert's own. But Otto's wife has not been keen on his childhood toy and requested to keep the doll locked up. Robert was allegedly not fond of this. He is said to have repeatedly weaseled his way out and situated himself in a chair facing out of an upstairs window where he could be seen by passerbys below. People who passed 534 Eaton Street soon avoided walking near the house altogether. Locals swore that the doll would disappear and reappear facing another direction or that its gaze would follow him as they passed. Visitors inside the artist's house also claimed that they would also hear footsteps coming from the attic and that things would seem to move about in the home on their own with no explanation. After Robert Eugene Otto died in 1974, a woman named Myrtle Reuter purchased the artist's house, which meant Robert the doll had a brand new caretaker. Myrtle lived with Robert for 20 years. It said that she even took him with her and when she moved to a new home in the 1980s. Finally, she donated the creepy doll to the Fort East Martello Museum in 1994, claiming that the doll was indeed haunted. The museum accepted the doll and its baggage, assuming Reuter's claims were of course nonsense. Almost immediately, however, the museum employees reported their own inexplicable happenings with the doll. Nonetheless, numerous visitors have lined up to see Robert the doll on display. Even stranger, fans and fearful believers send letters directly to Robert, sometimes praying to him, sometimes apologizing to him, having looked at him in the wrong way, while visiting the museum. Convertito says he probably gets one to three letters a day. Some visitors write to ask Robert for advice or if he could place a curse on people who have wronged him. Since his arrival, Robert has received over a thousand letters, but that's not all he receives. Visitors have been known to leave candy, money, and sometimes even joints. In 2015, a Robert the Doll movie was released and simply titled Robert. The film loosely follows the origin story of Robert the Doll, beginning with his arrival in the Otto family. Yes, the family in the movie is indeed named Otto. Who would have thought a doll would have so much power? Even after 116 years, Robert seemed to be sharp as ever. And to this day, visitors claim that cameras malfunction in his presence and electronic devices go haywire. To date, four sequels have followed. The Curse of Robert the Doll in 2016, The Toy Maker in 2017, Revenge of Robert the Doll in 2018, and Robert Reborn in 2019. Even more so, Robert the Doll has even inspired a franchise of its own too, but not on him. We call him Chucky. What do you believe? Do you believe that Robert the Doll is real? Do you believe that Robert the Doll could be an urban legend? You decide.